Genesis 15. Appreciate everybody being here. Everybody online. God's good. I was mentioning, um, I was talking in the office to Gary and Matthew and John and I don't remember who all else was in there. But I've always been this way. I've always just had this inquisitive mind about mysteries and stuff that some people say they see and some people don't believe in. And, and I, since 97, when God said, Mike, let's study the Bible. Let's just really dig into this thing. And I decided to, to just try to wipe this slate clean of everything that my preconceived notions, doctrines that I had held to, things that I believed in that not necessarily, I don't necessarily believe some of the things I believed when I was 16, 20 years old or whatever. Um, and that's because I decided to learn them, the Bible, from the Bible instead of hearing them from what men say. How many different, how many different denominations are there? Protestant denominations, different ones. It's got to be over a thousand. That all represents over a thousand different views on who Jesus is, salvation, the gospel, church government, worship styles, you name it. And I do know that God makes people different. But I've just asked God questions. First, it was about Bible prophecy. Then it turned into the Bible itself. Is it right? And which turned into learning doctrine better. Learning it from the scriptures. Being able to provide scripture for what, if I say I believe this. Here's the scripture why I believe this. And that actually feeds into what we're going to talk about tonight, Genesis 15. Because he mentions to Abram that he brings the stars in and says, see those stars? If you can tell the number. And he equates the seed of Israel, the seed of Abraham, with the stars of heaven. And it's not just a metaphor. It's not just symbolically and, but it doesn't go beyond that. Because if, it, if it's all it was was symbolic, Abraham is still dead. And when we die, we're going to remain dead. So obviously, the heavens are put above us for a reason. And it is, that's where we want to go. We want to be there. Now, man corrupts that. Man says, well, I don't want to go to the God heaven. I want to go to the Mars heaven or the moon heaven or... I want to go to another planet, that heaven. And man is building things now to accomplish exactly that. Let's go to the moon first. Let's get, it, let's get out of the earth first. We did that in the 60s. The Russians beat us. So let's go to the moon now, next. So we beat them. Now China's got something we don't got. They've got stuff on the back of the moon. And now we're looking at Mars. Let's go to Mars. And now we put a new rover on there that can do things now. It's never been done before. And I don't think this is a good idea, ever. We've, this new rover that's on Mars has the ability to bring Martian soil up from the surface of Mars and bring it back here. I've seen that movie. It turns out really bad. Okay? So, and it's basically the idea. We're going to go there. If God tarries the Lord's return and His judgment... You watch and see. Man will be there. But he won't stop there. Because Mars is not over here to the left. Mars is up. And Jupiter is upper from Mars. We Look at everything up. Saturn's higher than Jupiter. Neptune's higher than Saturn. Then the next star is higher than all of them. It's a farther place to go to in the heavens. And will we ever get there? Believe it or not. They are working on the, th the equations to warp space, to make space. Here's Earth, and here's a star that is, let's say, 80 light years from Earth. 
which we can't do, never make it. So let's do something that's a lot more harder. Let's bend space and make them to where they're like this close together. And you say it's not possible. And I can show you in the Bible. Is not the heavens going to be rolled as a scroll? I can show you two verses that says that. Okay? Again, literal or just merely symbolic? I believe the Bible for what it says. Okay? So, and I know that they are working on the equations to do exactly that. It's not science fiction anymore. It's not, we're now approaching science fact in history. And this is what's going to happen. So, what are the stars? What does NASA, and I don't discount everything NASA says. I do have a scientific mind. I'm not a scientist, but... I try to think rationally. I believe the moon's 250,000 miles up in the air, and I believe the sun's 93 million miles away from here, and I do believe that. But are they more, is our sun and moon and the stars, are they more than what science says they are? Are they more than what Jet Propulsion Laboratory says they are? Are the stars more, are they merely lights in the sky, other suns, in far distant places. Are they that? Yes. But are they more than that? And that's what I believe. So Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. We read that verse this morning. And I could talk about that. People have asked the question about who's going to get the most rewards in heaven. I've got one that I want. And it's right here. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. If I gain Christ, what more should I want? What more can I have? What more should I ask for? I have Christ. I have the Lord. I will be his son forever and ever and ever. So we're counting pennies here when God's going to give us the entire creation. That's the way I look at it. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. That was his main servant, Eliezer. And Abram's thinking, here's, here's what my mind says. My mind says, since I'm 80 years old, somewhere around in there, and Sarah's 70, we're not ever going to have kids. So I'm thinking that Eliezer, my servant, when he has a son, I'm going to give all my stuff, my inheritance, to Eliezer so he can give it to his son. That's what Abram's thinking right now. But he's wrong, isn't he? And we know he's wrong. Because that's not what God meant. Even though God has already promised him that his seed is going to, he's going to have an offspring. He knows it. But he doesn't understand it quite yet. And that's fine with God. God gets that. He doesn't count off points because we don't understand everything. He just says, believe it. He gives us all the points. So he said, Abram said, behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him. The Bible, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God came unto him. Saying, this shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. So stop right here. So the promise that God made to Abram, was it literal or merely symbolic, Gary? It was literal, wasn't it? And see, Abram's thinking, maybe it's symbolic. Maybe I'll adopt Eliezer, Eliezer and his son. And that's what God meant. And God, and he asked God that question. God, did you really mean, even because you haven't given me a son yet, and I'm an old man now, so did you mean this literally or symbolically? What was Sarah's problem when she gave Hagar to Abraham? Did she not think the same thing? Maybe God meant this symbolically, since Hagar is mine, my property, that's how Sarah saw her, 
since she's mine and if she has a child that is from my husband, even though I don't like the idea of my husband being with her, maybe God meant this. And that's where we get into the problem. Everybody gets into this problem every time they read the Bible is thinking that God meant something that he didn't actually say. I do it, you do it, we all do it, we've done it. Christians have done it for years. And I don't think I'm better than anybody because I'm trying to teach myself not to do it anymore because I still do it. But that's the problem that we get into is that we think that God didn't actually mean exactly what he said, but he does. So he says, uh, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bow shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward the heaven and tell the stars. So you know what he did, don't you? So Abram's standing here, and God says, Abram, come over here. So Abram does this. Okay, God, what do you want me to do this? God says, so you can get a better look. That was a joke. <laughs> They're closer now, because you moved 10 feet forward. Chris, I always know you're going to laugh at them, no matter what they are. I like you. Um... He brought him forth abroad, said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars that thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Now, what in the Bible do we know is numberless? Well, the stars. Sand of the sea. What else? Hairs on your head? It's because the number's changing constantly. Okay? What else? The company of angels. An innumerable company of angels. So all of those things together mean something. Because they're without number. We cannot comprehend that. We cannot fathom something, JR, that ends numbers. Can we? Because you can always keep adding. You can do what Joe Biden's doing. Just keep adding zeros. There you go. Just print more money. And we'll have it. We're the government. Okay? That's the way some people see the economy of the world. Just print more money. It doesn't work. And we're going to find that out. But anyway, so the, the stars are innumerable. Let's pray and then we'll get into that. Father, bless your word. Thank you, dear God, for giving us a mind that wants to know. Anybody, Father, that does not want to know more about you I just I feel sorry for them because there's so much more to know I will never get done knowing you we'll never get done learning you and when we sit a billion years in heaven it's what we're gonna do father I'm I'm in for that class that's what I want so father while we're here teach us what you can and if we ask for more you promised that you would give us more. So teach us to ask, teach us to search, to knock, to seek. Because that's what I want. I want to know. So bless your word and bless your people tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So shall thy seed be. And he believed in Abram right then. Boom. He believed the Lord, didn't he? So he, he Abram learned... That if God said something, he meant exactly to the letter. That's what he meant. We don't have to ask the question, God, did you really mean this when you said this? Now we know the answer. Abram believed it. And immediately, you could, you could say, this is the day Abram got saved. You could say that. Because right here is what Paul based salvation on. His doctrine of salvation was based on the story of Abram believing God and God taking all of Abram's sins away from him immediately and putting in his debit column righteousness on every line. It's like, Megan, if you owed a $100 gas bill or water bill, and said, God, I don't have $100 to pay the bill. How can I pay the bill? And God says, here, here's a check for a million dollars. Pay the bill. Yeah, amen. 
uh, God can't pay the rent now. It's a thousand dollars. Here's a check for a million dollars. Pay the rent. Now you, and you only paid out eleven hundred, right? Because where sin abounds, God always overpays the bill. That's biblical, isn't it? Boy, if Kenneth Copeland could get a hold of me, man. He'd really be raking it in. But you could say right here is where Abram gets saved. Because as of this point right here, Abram has no sins in his column whatsoever. And he never will. Never will. Because God has given him, he counted it. See the word count? That is an accounting legal term. It's a term used in courts of laws. It's a term used in accounting. It's a term that rose comes in here what do you think rose does she counts she sits in her office and counts who came in for church she sits and counts the offerings that come in she counts what goes out she keeps record of the church checkbooks and the church accounts she counts that and she get you ought to see her when she counted wrong she gets frustrated and joe's got to put up with her because she takes it home right so this is a legal term here and if God broke this, he's liable for damages. God cannot break his own accounting. He cannot cook the books. And if God attributes righteousness to Abram, can he ever charge him with a sin? No, he can't do it because he's already forgiven, for, forgiven all of them. That's what that means. So again, you could say right here, now... This is Genesis 15, two chapters later, he's going to change his name. And we're going to talk about that Sunday morning in Sunday school. But that's coming later. But right here is it for Abram. And he may not realize it, but God's not going to charge him with sin. So, and he said, tell the stars. Look now toward heaven and tell the stars. So tell, the word tell is an old numbering word. Give the tell of it. Tell how much is there. And so I, re I remember this vaguely. I don't have the dates. But there was an astronomer, let's say 400 years ago, that came up with a number. He said he counted the stars in the night sky, summer and winter both, and added them up. And came up with something like 11 or 1,200 stars. Well, it's not bad for, you know, 700 years ago or whatever. No telescopes, right? All he can count is the ones he can see. And as of that time, no telescopes means we didn't even know the planet Neptune was even there. We didn't know it was there because nobody could see it. So then a few years later, who was it? Marco Polo goes to, the, goes to Asia and finds all their inventions and brings them back to, to Europe, to Italy. Now there's a renaissance of knowledge because they took two lenses and put them together and they went, I can see stuff close now. So they pointed them up. And all of a sudden, they see that there's stars up there they never knew were there. For the first time, we can see them now. And they never knew they were there. So forget that 1,200 number, whatever that was. I don't remember what it was. But forget that number. That's gone. So now you've got guys who can afford to build telescopes. And all of them are starting to look up. And they're seeing stars. They, and they're mapping them. And, they're, and they can't keep track. Because everywhere they look, there's more of them. And more. And then we start building bigger telescopes and we start finding more. And we start building bigger telescopes and we start finding more. Then we got the idea, since we're sending a usable craft up to space, let's put a telescope up in space. They put the Hubble telescope up there. Why space? Because the Earth's atmosphere dilutes the picture. It's like looking in cloudy water, milky water. It 
dilutes what you see and you can't see through the haze of the earth. So they usually build these observatories up on high mountains where the atmosphere is thin, they can see better. But when we finally put one up in space, and I didn't put the picture up here, I usually do. But they aimed Hubble at a spot, a blank black spot. Take your fingers and just make the smallest distance possible between your two fingers and hold it up to the sky. You guys look funny doing that, but that's what they did. They picked a spot that big, Gary, and they aimed the Hubble at that spot. Try, I don't know how many days or weeks, but it took them weeks for, to gather in. It's like leaving a shutter. If you know anything about a camera, you leave the shutter open, more light comes in as you can do night photography. So they left the shutter open for weeks to let all that light come in. And they looked at it and their jaw dropped because in a spot they thought there was nothing there. They saw these dots of light and they realized that those dots of light were not stars. They were galaxies. Galaxies have billions of stars in them and they could see dots going as far back as they could possibly see. And so they decided we'll never know how far that back that goes. We'll never know the number of stars. This Bible's right, is it? Okay. And God said that about his seed. So here's what's interesting to me. When he camped Israel in the wilderness, he lined them up a certain way. And how many tribes were there? Twelve. How many months are there? It's not an accident. It's not, not with God. It's not an accident. Because we know that's measuring the distance from one spot in the night sky, 12 months later, to the next spot, and I'm dizzy now. But that's what they did. So, every month, you look up, there's a new set of stars in the sky. Next month, there'll be another set. Next month, another set. Well, if you look at the camp of Israel, he did it exactly that way because everybody had a spot to camp in. Judah, even though they were not firstborn, they always got the lead spot. When, when the camp picked up and left, God wrote it in the law that Judah always had to go first. God is a God of order, is he not? He doesn't just say, everybody gang pile up and move when you're ready. They had to line up like they were third graders. Okay? They had to line up like they were going to the drinking fountain. And God put Judah first. And Dan was always last. He's always the tail of the serpent. That's kind of how I see Dan. He's always the tail. Always. Dan always had to camp at the north. Judah always to the east. Gad, Simeon, Reuben, always to the south. Benjamin, Manasseh, and Ephraim, always to the west. And it was like that every, for 40 years, they learned this and they taught it to their children. When we stop, find west, because that's where we have to go. We can't park, and daddy, can we park where Naphtali is? No, we're Gadites. We can't go there. God won't let us. And so what it, the same thing God did with Israel in the wilderness is the same thing he did with the stars at night. Every year, the same stars are in the same position every night. And it's been that way for thousands of years. It's been that way ever since we started looking at stars. So, what's down here, God says is going to match. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? And that's what he did. So, he literally parked the camp of Israel and the tribes just like he parked the stars in the night sky. Divided them up by 12 and put them in their spot just like, and I don't use the word zodiac because it's an occult term, but just like the, the monthly sky, the Maseroth, you can call it that because that's in the Bible, but just like the monthly, nightly stars, God planted Israel. So what he's doing already, he's telling us and them, you're already counted as the stars. I already see you that way. 
Because one of these days, Israel is not going to live in the desert anymore. Where are they going to live? Where are we going to live? Heaven. Okay? So, Psalm 19. Turn there. You remember, Chris, you remember Apollo 11? How old were you, Apollo 11? That would be 1969. Huh? How old were you then? I was three. See, it doesn't take me near as long to count that as it does you. Yeah. So I don't remember it. Yeah. 1969. I was born in 66, so I was three. So I don't remember it. Okay? Yeah, I was. But I would have loved to have seen him land on the moon. Like I would have, I would have loved that. I grew up, I grew up in the sixties and seventies. I looked at astronauts. I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to go up there. I will one of these days. I'm going. No spacesuit, nothing. But I, I just, those, they were my heroes going up there. Wow, what's that? What's that even like? And so the stars, they fascinated me. I'm not an astronomer. I don't know all of them. I'm not an astrologer, guarantee you that. But I know what they are. I know what God says they are, and I believe that. The heavens declare the glory of God. Do they? Yes. And look what he said. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. The whole of the, the expanse of space shows you God's... Because God... Notice he said the word handiwork. Did not God say that the universe, the heavens, fit in the span of his hand? So is it possible, do you believe it's possible for God to, with his hand, make the entire heavens, second heavens? Yes! It's his handiwork. He put them up there. I'm fine. Oh, that's not for me. Anyway, um, day unto day, and this is what he means by that. Day unto day, utter a speech. Night unto night shows knowledge. So you look in the Bible for every verse in every place in the Bible where God talks about the day and the night and the sun and the moon and the stars and how the day comes back around again. Ecclesiastes 1, the sun goes down, the sun comes back up again. Um, in Lamentations, where he talks about his mercy and his truth, he renews it every day. So God was mad at you yesterday for what you did. When you got up today, God said, we're starting all over again. Because that's what you do with your children. Right? You can be mad at them one day and hug them, squeeze them the next day and not be mad at them anymore because they're your kids. And that's what God tells us in Lamentations. He's telling us the entire gospel plan through the pages of the Bible. You can see it up in the heavens and how the heavens work. The sun, we measure time in 24 hours. There's exactly 24 of them. And the 24 elders that surround the throne of God. There's a connection there. The 12 stars with the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. There is a connection there. You read the Bible and see the heavens telling you how God works and how God does things. And does God ever do anything willy-nilly, just throw it out there and see what happens? No, he has an order to everything. Even the planets. And the word planet is a Greek word that means literally means wandering star. And it's the word that was it Jude or Peter used when he called the false prophets the wandering stars. The Greek word is planetes, planets. It's because David, they looked up and they saw Orion in one spot and they saw the Big Dipper and they saw the North Star, but they kept seeing these stars that moved around and weren't in the same place every month. And they didn't know what they were. So they called them wandering stars. We now know what they are. They're Venus and Mercury and Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, which are the ones we can see. And because of their orbit, their ring that they follow and their ordinance, that's a Bible word, because of the ordinance that they follow in, they're going to be in a different spot than the rest of the stars. And they didn't know that, but we know that now. We know that even with the planets, there's still an order to it. God does everything in order. Don't think he doesn't. Amen? And if God has a plan for you, because he promised that as the stars are, we're going to be, and he sees us that way, 
What that means is, as ordered as he put the universe, the heavens, if God's going to do something in my life, he may have to do three or four things before he does that. Does that make sense to everybody? So I've asked God for hundreds of things I want him to do in my life. Things I don't like, things I want him to change, things I want him to make different. God says, okay, but that's over here. Now, I've already mapped your life out, Mike. I've already got it ordered. And when we trust in the Lord with all of our heart, lean not to our own understanding, in all of our ways acknowledge him, he shall direct our, which is exactly what the stars and the planets are in. They're in a path. They follow a path and they never vary from it, ever. And my dad was a big time. He planted by the farmer's almanac. He fished by the farmer's almanac. He would call me. Mike, the crappie down at Lake Kincaid, Illinois, are spawning next week. Dad, how do you know? What are you, a fish? What do you talk to them? He had a farmer's almanac. He knew that crappie spawned certain signs moons in a certain place. I don't know how he did it, but he knew it. And every year he got a new farmer's almanac. I used to read it. I used to look at it. And I didn't understand it, but dad did. And he planted exactly the way God told him to in Genesis chapter one. They shall be for signs and for seasons and days and years. And dad did it. And he was right. We'd go to the spot he knew they'd be spawning on. There they were. Exactly that way. Uh, verse 3, there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That's because everything is under the heavens. Their line is gone out through all the... And you could also read verse 3 as God knows how to speak all the languages of people, doesn't he? So does God depend on us to sloppily translate Bible verses? No, he does it. Because he knows how to speak all the languages. Their line is, their line, a line is a verse. It's a sentence. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words. That means the same thing to the end of the world. In them, the heavens, hath he set a tabernacle. Let's go back here. Where's the tabernacle in this picture? It's in the middle. So... In this picture where Judah and Issachar, and I've got a little rose compass up, compass rose up there. North is that way on this picture. East is sort of where Matthew's guitar is, and west is up, up there. The priest went in the gate of the tabernacle east. He's the son. He's Christ. The high priest is Christ going east to west in the tabernacle. And it's the rising, the setting of the sun. And especially on the Day of Atonement. Because on the Day of Atonement, all the sins are going to be forgiven. The blood is going to be carried from the east to the west, carried into the most holy place, sprinkled seven times for the atonement of everybody's sins for an entire year. 365 days worth of sins, now gone. But they had to do it every year. Christ... Because he's from beyond this, he's eternal, he only has to do it once. And when I'm done here, I'm going to go upstairs, and I'm going to start on that Watchman broadcast, and I'm, I, I'm going to probably get fired up. Because those Catholic priests desecrate the crucifixion of Christ so grotesquely, it angers me. When I, when I read what I read about it and what they believe about it, it angers me to know what they believe, know what they teach. And Dee and I were talking this morning. She's right. They believe they can call Jesus down from heaven, put him in that cookie. Here's Jesus right here. They believe they can do that. And I'm telling you, it angers me because God never said anything about that in his word. Not one word. We're not saved by eating. We're saved by believing. Amen? 
uh, but the, the priest goes east to west just like the sun. So Psalm 19, again, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom. Where is Jesus coming from? The east. He's coming from the east. He's the bridegroom who said, As lightning shineth in the east and goeth to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. He is the Son, S-U-N, and Son, S-O-N, and He is the bridegroom coming from the east and coming by to pick us up and take us to be with Him where? As the stars. Coming forth, coming out of His chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit tells you the world's not flat. His circuit unto the ends of it and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Even Antarctica has heat. Little tiny bit. But they've got sunlight for six months. So this Bible's right. This, this, this was written 3,000 years ago before any telescopes, and yet David understood it, Solomon understood it. Anybody who reads the Bible, you want to know about the universe, you want to know about the heavens, it's, it's in this book right here. Genesis 22. Notice, these are the places that God said his seed shall be like the stars. Genesis, he said it back in... Genesis 15, tell the stars that thou be able to number them, so shall thy seed be. Genesis twenty-two seventeen, 17, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thee. Multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven. Second time he said it. And as the sand, you mentioned the sand, which is upon the seashore, and, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Who's our enemies? Hell. What did Jesus say about the church? And the rock, upon this rock I will, and uh, shall not prevail against it. We're going to possess the seed of his enemies. We're going to own it. Exodus thirty-two thirteen. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and says unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. As the stars. Deuteronomy 1.10, the Lord your God hath multiplied you, and behold, you are this day. See, that's what I told you. God already was seeing them. When he put them in the wilderness, in those 12 groups, in those spots, I already see you as the stars. So back in Deuteronomy, you are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. I all, and God sees us, Matthew, that way right now. But we're not there yet. But conditionally and positionally and in every way you can imagine it, God already sees us as the stars of heaven, as the sons of God. Hebrews 11, therefore sprang there one, even one, even of one, and him as good as dead. Abraham, Abraham was how old? A hundred. How, or nine, yeah, a hundred. How old was Sarah? Ninety. hundred-year-old men don't conceive children. Ninety-year-old women don't. And him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sandwiches by the seashore innumerable he uses that exact term innumerable means they cannot ever be numbered so you know I've made a point of this a couple times how how do you JR how do you end numbers when you can just keep adding zeros and even if you don't have a word for it to call it billions or zillions or quadrillions or quintillions or booger billions or whatever. You can keep adding zeros to a one for how long? How, how far does pi go out? It's three, 
0.14, and it's an infinite number. And it's because pi is how you measure a circle. And where does the circle begin? Where does the circle end? There and there. But it doesn't. It just keeps going around and around and around. And that's what he's doing. He's showing you, number one, how smart he is. If God can be above all the numbers, because he's the most high God, that means you can keep adding all the numbers you want to. God's still going to be on top of the pile of every one of them. How do you, then you cut off a third of an innumerable amount? Take infinity. Take infinity, Gary. Get your calculator out and divide infinity into three equal portions. Because that's what you're doing. You're dividing an endless amount. So how many angels are there? We don't know. They just keep going and going and going and going. And yet God has divided them into three equal parts. And a third of them, this was saying a while ago. Is God symbolically going to put a third of the stars on the earth? Or is he literally going to put a third of the stars on the earth? And if he's going to literally do it, how? Because a third of those galaxies up there are about 13 billion light years away. Meaning, and this is another thing. I know the universe is 6,000 years old. How did light from, thir David, how did light from 13 billion light years away already reach the earth? How did it happen, David? God knows, ask him. It's like me asking you, how's the moon going to turn to blood? I don't know. But boy, would I like to find out. I want to know. Okay? This, believe it or not, I do spend my day like this. How's this going to, how's this going to happen? Stars, stars equal angels. Every, and I asked Gary the question. I said, Gary... If you were to read nothing but the Bible and you knew nothing of the stars except what the Bible said about them, what would the Bible tell you they were? Angels. So that's why I said, yeah, I believe that they're big suns, 10 light years away, 100 light years away, a billion light years away. A hundred billion million light years away. Because I think the universe goes way farther than we've able seen it yet. But I don't just believe that what they are ends where NASA says they end. I think there's more to them than that. And I think the Bible tells us exactly what they in reality are. Angelic beings. What, are the, what is our sun made of? What, what is it? It's fire, right? What are the angels made of? David, what are the angels made of? Light. Fire. You're supposed to say fire. Sorry, fire. <laughs> fire. Never yell fire in a crowded room. This is why it's safe here. <laughs> That's a pretty good one, wasn't it? I'm telling you, I'm on a roll, man. Write all these down for me. Um... Numbers 24, 17. This is Jesus. Actually, Jesus. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. So here's, this is going to blow my brain. But not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. And he capitalized, the, the King James translators capitalized the letter S here to show us that they know it's deity. And a scepter. Remember what I said about Jesus and literalness. If God says he literally is a scepter, what is he? He's a scepter. Is he really a lamb? Well, he's got woolly hair. He's a lamb. If he, God says he's a scepter, he's a scepter. We just may not understand everything a scepter is. You see, just believe the Bible and shall rise out of Israel. But he said, a star out of Jacob. So, let me ask you a question. What is the morning star? Huh? I'm, I was, actually, I was kind of hoping you'd say Venus so I could say, Wrong! 
Everybody says the morning star is Venus. But Venus is not just a star that appears in the morning. It also, for another four years, shows up in the evening. It's a both a morning and an evening star. So it can't be Venus. The morning star is the sun. Because that's what Jesus is. The sun. And I didn't say a sun. I said the sun. Now, I don't understand it. But again, when it comes to asking me if I'm going to believe the literal side or the merely symbolic side, I will lean toward the literalness of it every single time, even if I don't understand it. Because I cannot find a place that says he's not really the son. I can't find that verse. I can only find the verses that say he's the son. He is the son. He, what did we just learn from Psalm 19? The son's the bridegroom. Okay? What does Malachi 4 tell us? He's this capital S-U-N of righteousness who arises with healing in his wings. So these are things, I just believe it, and then I start looking for why is it that way. He's the star out of Jacob. The scepter shall rise out of Israel. Job 38, 7. Job, actually, this is how the Bible speaks. It gives you one definition, then the other in the same verse. When the morning stars sing together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The Bible does that in the hundreds of times, if not thousands of times. I haven't counted them all. I don't know them all. But it'll tell you one thing and in the same verse tell you another synonym for it. And they're going to mean the same thing. It's like strangers and aliens. In Hebrews, we are the strangers and aliens. Here, right now, you ought to see what I, the look I'm getting from your son. We're the strangers and aliens here because we didn't, we weren't, our land of nativity is not here. Where's our birth from? Jerusalem above. So while we're here, we're strangers and we're alien to this world, meaning we don't belong here. Say amen to that. Amen. Linda didn't belong here in, in, anymore. Amen? Wayne didn't belong here anymore. All these other people we've told bye to, they didn't belong here anymore. They went to their home. And we mean that in every sense of the word. So, Job 38, 7, when the morning stars sang together, all the sons of God shouted for joy. The Bible's telling you that the sons of God are the morning stars. They're telling you they're the stars. That's what they are. Philippians 2.15. Now we are the... Every time in the Old Testament when it says sons of God, it means angels. And every single time when you read sons of God in the New Testament, it means us. Every time. Philippians 2. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. Again, is that metaphoric, symbolic, or is it literal? Were you not born again? Yes. Were you, and who's your father? God. What was the seed? The Bible. Thus, we literally are born again and we are the sons of God. In, in the literal sense of it. That's what we are. And it even says here in Philippians... That the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. How true is that? Is that just symbolic? That's literal. Among whom ye shine as what? Lights in the world. Remember, God already sees us on this earth as his sons and as what, Matthew? Yes, right. Stars, Matthew. Very good. You didn't see my lips move. You didn't see my lips move. Not at all. He sees us. He saw Israel as stars. Ye are now this day as stars. We also are sons of God. Now, if you study that phrase, sons of God, in the New Testament, 
you'll find we don't have the body yet. We're called sons of God. It's, it's like when Malachi was in Elisha's belly, was he her son? Sure. In every sense of the word. We hadn't been born yet. He had the title, the position, the designation of her son, but he didn't have the body yet. Now he's got the cute little chubby body. Cute little chubby monkey meat, I call him. He's so cute. Okay? And he smiled at me three times a day, so my day is over with. Uh, Revelation 12. This is what I was getting at. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. Does he literally have seven heads and ten horns? Yes. And seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. So I can't believe anything beyond that. I can't believe something different from that. I know that. And now I've heard... You know, people say, well, that's going to be a meteor shower. That's what that means. There's going to be a... Because they're not really, not really stars. They're meteors. Space rocks. Going to fall to the earth. Well, that's not what he said. Third of the stars of heaven means what it means. And cast them to the earth. And then he says in verse 9 that those were angels. And his angels were cast out with him. So the Bible's piecing these things together for you. Telling you, and this goes all the way back to Genesis 15 where we started. Abram, your seed is going to be the stars. I'm going to put them up there. They're not there now. They haven't even been born yet. But one of these days, if a third of the stars are kicked out, is there not now room for us? So what, think of Canaan land and what it represents. It's supposed to represent heaven. What did God do with the inhabitants of Canaan land? Kicked them out. Why? Rebellion and disobedience. He said that. Who did he put in their place? The 12 tribes. And what that is, is a picture of what he's going to do with all the righteous, Jew and Gentile. He's taking those wicked, evil angels out of their place and he's going to put us in their place. What did, what did God do with Judas's office that he held as a, an apostle? What did God do with his place? Once he put Judas out, did he leave it empty? He filled it with Matthias. He put somebody else in his place. So when you read Revelation 7 and you find out that Dan is missing from the list of the 12 tribes, he took Dan out and put in his place Manasseh. Okay? Or Levi. However you want to look at it. Because Levi's in there too. So anyway, that's what I believe. I believe, yeah, I believe the stars, they're billions of miles out there. They're flaming red hot balls of cosmic gas burning at billions of degrees Fahrenheit. But that's not all they are. They are the angels. They have names. Okay? What was it that led the wise men to Bethlehem? It was a star that moved, didn't it? It wasn't just a cosmic, normal star event. And that's what everybody's looking at. It was a star that literally led them and went to the exact spot that Jesus was living at at that time. And they went right to the house where he was. Is that what happened? That star moved. That was no ordinary, like we think of stars. It was what God, it was an angel. But I believe that. Okay? Did I say that enough? All right, y'all pray for me, because now I've got to go upstairs. Um, 
Let me read this and let's dismiss. Mark 12, you can turn there. But this is what Jesus said. Jesus answering said unto them, Do you not therefore err because you know not the Scriptures? So if you're wrong about something, correct the error. Learn the right answer. You are wrong because I've not memorized 1,189 chapters of the Bible. That's why I'm wrong about things. There are verses I forgot about or chapters that I have not memorized I don't know. So I won't know all 1,189 chapters in this world. I don't think I can memorize that. But we are, we are wrong in how we think because there are other verses in the Bible we have not considered. We have not read them or we don't remember them or whatever. Because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God. For when they shall rise from the dead, they, the angels, neither marry nor are... Oh, no. He's talking about the people. Because the issue was if a man dies, leaves no seed, and his seven brothers marry the same, get poor wife, poor woman... Got to be with six of his ugly brothers. She picked the one she wanted. And they all died, leave no seed. Whose wife is she in heaven? And Jesus said, you have no idea what you're talking about. That's a, he basically said it's a stupid question. Why? Because you don't read the Bible. You don't know the, you're in error because you don't know the scriptures. And he said, when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. That's what we're going to be. His angels. His sons of God. His lights shining in the earth. His stars. Let's pray. Father, thank you. This book is deeper than the deepest oceans, higher than the heavens. And yet this book is simple enough, written in a simple way, so that unlearned and ignorant people like us can believe it we can understand it father give us more and give us a desire and a thirst i've prayed father that to everyone who asks you god that you would show them something brand new from the bible that they never knew was in there father do that with me too show me something new but show people that Make them hunger for more. Bless your word. We thank you, Lord, for its authority over our lives and for directing our steps and our paths. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.